start. So, um, well, almost. Um, so this talk is Intro to Database Normalization, which is fancy techno jargon for organizing your data into different tables. And how, when you have tables that relate to each other, how to properly organize those. This is going to be real basic. Uh, I really only expect you to know uh, what a table and column is in a database. Um, so if you've messed around with Postgres or MySQL or um, whatever, Oracle, a whole bunch, any relational database, these rules, everything I'm talking about, applies to all relational databases. Yeah? Are we going to be covering any aspects where normalization and Postgres intersect uniquely, or is Inter this what? Inter just generic normalization? Uh, I didn't catch the first part of that. Are we covering like areas where Postgres and normalization intersect uniquely? Like, uh, you mean we spe normalize specific, to a specific size because this thing is in Postgres? And no, is no, I'm not going to. No, not all. Oh, I don't think any of this is going to be Postgres specific. Um, which is the beauty of relational databases. There's very little that is uh, specific. Uh, until you get into some really advanced performance issues, which I'm not going to talk about okay, in this so one. Okay, that would be an advanced topic. For yeah, if you have, respect. yeah, uh, which would be a good idea for a talk. Yeah, I wasn't is, sure what this talk It's usually exactly. huge tables is, is when you've, you've got, uh, oh, but for those okay, I've got the answer for you. Tomorrow, I'm giving a talk on 11 and 11, the 11 new features in Postgres 11, and the first huge, the, the biggest topic in that list of the 11 is partitioning, which is all about optimizing for performance when you have really huge tables. So if you want to know about that, come to the first part of my talk tomorrow. Oh, I'm already planning on attending that for a Okay, you're just locked into this room, is that? <laughs> it's a big focus for me, yes. All right. So, um, me, I am a developer, Basil Bork. I've been doing um, custom database-backed apps for years uh, for business. And nowadays, I work in using Java uh, with Vaadin, which is a web app development tool. So you do everything in Java on the back end, which is great. You have the whole Java universe. Uh, but then you say, I want a field, I want a label, I want a button. And it automatically generates all the HTML, CSS, JavaScript, I don't have to know all that stuff. I just use Java on the back end. Um, and then I usually, when I'm doing database work, I use Postgres nowadays, almost always. Oh, H2 is another one, another, another relational database that all of these rules I'm going to talk about apply to. H2 is a, Java, a pure Java database. I use that for smaller things and Postgres for really big or important uh, work. Important meaning I, uh, safety of my data is paramount. Um, so, we run a booth over at the trade show. Seattle Postgres User Group is what recruited me to be here. So, uh, you've got great, really smart uh, women and men over there um, who are world class experts on Postgres. So, uh, you can ask your questions for free this weekend. And if you're interested in Postgres, come by our, um, we have go to meetup.com and, and look for Seattle Postgres. So let's dive into it. First thing about organizing your um, databases uh, is when you're setting up a table and going to add a column, you have to figure out uh, atomic values. So um, you're going to have a field. A field on a record or a column on the table means the same thing. Um, you need to look at the smallest unit of information that's meaningful to you. And that is the whole catch. It's whatever the, the business context is going to determine what kind of meaning, and I'm going to have lots of examples to explain this. Um, generally, the tip is, uh, when are you going to search or sort by? Uh, if it's a value within another value, then that's not atomic. You need to break those out. So let's look at an example of that. Um, uh, here, I've got a person table, and I've got a first name or given name, and a last name or surname. So we've broken out the first name last name separately. Uh, but the catch is, does that really make sense? If you were doing a table about notes, and this is just casual, it's just a way for people to write down some casual thoughts, then when the spoke with, you probably don't need a first name, last name. And you don't need the user to be picking from a list uh, or anything like that. It's not, it's, it's not that rigid or uh, controlled. So in this case, this is, you would let them write in whatever they want. First name, last name, nickname, whatever. 
um, because we don't care. We're not going to sort the notes by last name, if that's your case. All of this is whatever your business rules are. But if the business rules here is that we have no intention to ever be sorting or searching by first name, last name, then we could get away with one field. That's atomic. Whereas a person table, you're probably going to be doing reports by person, and that's probably going to be by last name. You might sort by last name first and then first name second. So in that case, now we need to break these apart because they're each atomic values. Um, similar is address. You know, most database or developers, the first thing they do when they have an address is do an address line it's for the street address, the city, the state, the country, postal code. And I actually have a real life story is a colleague of mine has worked for decades in import export of food internationally. And he had all kinds of databases and he was always doing this and with the logistics. And then after many years, it dawned on him one day that never ever in all his years and all the many reports, they had never sorted anything and reported by country or by state or by city. And people were always frustrated because doing international addresses were so radically different in different places. And with food, they were always doing funky, like warehouse numbers, such and such. They were doing really complicated uh, addresses. So finally it dawned on him that this together is what was atomic in their business. Is that all that data together is all they ever cared about. So then he started doing one field with multiple lines of text and the users can type in whatever they want, they were so much happier. So that's an example, this is an example of a couple things. The atomic idea, but it's also, it is not easy to understand um, the business context when you're actually in it. It's kind of, you're, it's kind of like a fish in water, you know, you don't know what wet is. Um, often people who are in the business and know it really well, um, have a hard time designing the database. So if you are an expert in your own field that you're doing this development for, I recommend going over your database plan with someone else who's not your business. And then they will ask you the questions I'm gonna be walking you through. And uh, being objective can sometimes bring out this kind of an issue. Um, by the way, I'm gonna insert this database normalization, these rules for, for organizing your data. This is the only engineering and software engineering. My dad was a real engineer, like sending a man to the moon engineer. Um, there is no software engineering. It's all art and craft, except database normalization, because this is actually defined in mathematics. There's whole books on it. Um, the guy that invented it is called Dr. Cod, if you look him up. You, um, and he then later had another guy helping him, uh, Chris Date, Dr. Chris Date. <coughs> so he had this genius idea as a researcher at IBM that take this kind of arcane mathematical field and he realized that it fit a lot of business data. So, um, and relation is actually a math term. So that's what the relation and relational means. Um, so, what I'm talking about today is not my opinion. It's, this is like, this is proven mathematically. What's really great is those books on the math of theory, I've looked at them, I can't begin to comprehend them. The great news is you don't have to because the, the rules I'm gonna kind of guide you through today is the first steps. Um, the other nice thing is, when you do it wrong, you'll know it. Um, because it's going to be hard to uh, write reports, it's going to be hard to write your queries. It's going to be it's, you'll know it when you've done it wrong. And you basically learn, learning the hard way uh, is secondary to learning the uh, rules up front. So as I said before, it's really all about understanding the business rules and when these examples I give you today, You've got to pay special attention. I'm going to say, you know, if you mean this, then this is how you organize your tables. And that's what you have to get really clear on. And that's why I was saying is it's not always clear when you're in the middle of the business what your rules are. For one thing, in, when you're in the middle of the business, often there's exceptions and you gloss over them. It's like, yeah, we always run invoices this way, except for the funky ones where we give them to Carol and she takes care of it and she does this other thing. Well, you need to know that if it's all going to be in the store in the database. You need to know that you need to account for the exceptions as well as the general rule. So, what are some of the rules? Well, the first one to look, the first rule is look for repeating groups of values in your fields. So, here what we have is 
a scientific survey where we go to a certain place on a date and we take multiple temperature readings. So if we only care about these readings as a group, as a whole, then this is okay. This is the temperature readings is one single atomic value. So we're not gonna ever sort by the third, you know, 18 degrees Celsius. We're never gonna sort or search by that on its own. Contrast that with over there on that side, we are managing projects. Each project has a name and it has a due date. And then we have a list of employees. Here, we're putting their employee ID number together in one field. That's a no-no. That's what you don't wanna do. The reason is because those IDs relate to other tables. So we know, when you look at that, you know you're gonna do reports on the project. You're going to see people's names, not their ID numbers. So when you need to do that, you need to do a lookup into the other employee table. To do that lookup, you need to manage these numbers separately. They can't be crammed together. And we'll talk more about that. Any questions? That's one whole concept. <clears throat> Very common, people, people who, aren't, who are new to databases will tend to cram stuff in. Sometimes it's kind of a laziness, you know, it's like, oh, I'll just cram all this stuff together and not realize that you're actually relating to other entities uh, or other tables. The next thing to look for is repeating groups of fields. So if you look at this person, we've got, we notice some similarity, address city state, address city state. Now, this may or may not be a problem, you can see the res here is for residential and the mail. That's the clue. When you see these kind of prefix, uh, or when you see uh, uh, one, 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 two, 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 those are both clues that you've done it wrong. Um, but there's a big question mark here because you have to do some thinking to figure out, are, are these just a coincidence that these names are similar? Um, but do these two things represent two totally distinct separate things? So, and there's no easy answer here. Um, if you are just trying to track residential address for, um, as opposed to mailing, this is probably for legal reasons, this is how to get mailing to them. This is okay if you're really sure that there's only two, but if there could be any number of these addresses, then you are talking about a different entity, the entity of address that people have one or more of. And if that's the case, you want to break these out. We have a separate table of address, and they relate to the person table. So now one person can have one address, two address, three addresses, or more. But remember we said that there were different kinds of addresses. So we need to add a column on there for the which kind of address is it. Is it the mailing address, the residence address, a legal address, vacation address? Um, you could have as many as you want. Usually you know the, the, the values for this kind, address, mailing, legal. You can put those, you can define the values that are gonna go into this field. Uh, technical name for that's a domain. So one of the nice things in a database is you can define a domain and then attach it to this column. So it protects your data so you know that I, can, I only wanna have the word mailing or residence in that particular field. And now we're gonna talk about relationships between the tables. So for example, let's think about address and person here. Whoops. So when, uh, <laughs> when you do database analysis for, for database apps, you end up asking these questions a lot. And sometimes people think you're kind of batty almost because you end up asking, okay, when we have this kind of document, how does that relate to this kind of person? And you know, are there multiple people for that document or is it multiple, you know? That's what you wanna ask in both directions is how many of these relate to those and how many of those relate to these? So for the name and the address, it's like, for any one person, how many addresses can they have? And for each address, how many people can that address belong to? The answers are always zero, one, or many. That's the answer we're looking for as a, for database analysis. When we draw relationships, uh, this, there are different ways to draw the idea of the one, the zero, one, or many. This is commonly called crow's feet. It's very common. I like it. I use it all the time because it's very simple. It's not like it's standardized exactly. 
For example, I just stole this list, and I don't use this because one and one and only one to me is the same thing. Because if you mean that's still the bar here, that the idea is that the line we're linking two different tables together graphically, and then this tells me that on one end we want one and only one record. If we allow zero, then we would have a zero or one bar. If we know there's going to be many, we use the crow's foot, the triple flare. So this is zero, many, one, or many. And this little list really left off another one that I used, which would be zero, one, or many. The difference is um, this, to me, says we don't allow one. There has to be either none or lots. And there are business cases where that's the rule. So, well, let's take a look. So I'm using Apple's Keynote app. It does not have these nice little lines, so I had to fake it. These are a little clumsy. There are lots of apps that actually do draw database um, diagrams that do a better job than this. So this is not a little person. This is a zero, a one, or a many. And this is the one. So what we're saying is that for any one address record that we pull out of the database, it must belong to one and only one person. So this relationship often, um, some people like me call it parent-child, but in relational database, we only have single parent families. Um, I'll talk more about that later. So the idea is that every address belongs to one person, meaning it has one parent. And we don't allow, this means we do not allow orphans. We're going with that little metaphor. But these kids, you can't have an address that does not belong to anybody, which kind of makes sense. It's kind of senseless to have an uh, address floating around in your database and you don't know who it belongs to. So that's what I mean by these rules. It all depends on the business context. But zero, one, or many is what we're looking for. Um, now, these lines graphically, that's conceptual for humans to communicate to each other. That's, the database doesn't know what lines mean. So how does a database actually connect these two tables together? The answer is um, they have to have some identifier on the table. There has to be a column that identifies this person from all the other persons. And we call that, the technical word is primary key. Whatever column is the one. So like last name, there's lots of Johnsons, there's lots of Roberts and Susans. So these are not unique at all. They're going to have, you can have a lot, multiple Robert Smiths uh, or Susan Johnsons. So uh, we, have to, we have to add in some kind of a field to identify them if we don't have one in the data already. Likewise, over here, I'm adding an ID field. Now the catch is how do these two connect to each other? They each have their own ID. The answer is that with a foreign key, which is just a technical word that means I want to know the ID of the person that owns that address. And that's the glue that keeps the database together. That's how we can do things like get a query and look at all the addresses and have a person's name next to them. Even though they're two separate tables, we can build a report where we combine the two together. And it's because we not only add this column, but we go into the database and we say, this is a foreign key that relates to this field on this table. So you can name it whatever you want. That person ID doesn't have any meaning. There are lots of different, uh, like in real life, I call these P key, and then I would call this F key underscore person. So, but in addition to that, we have a SQL command that we would issue that says person ID is a foreign key that relates to the ID of person. <clears throat> so the keys. We've got natural keys or surrogate keys, two kinds. If you have your data, if your data has a number, like employees usually have an employee number, that could be your key, your primary key. Um, we call those natural, natural that it's in your data. If it's not your data, it's called a surrogate. And frankly, I have found people, there's pros and cons to these. I have learned the hard way that every time I've ever tried to do a natural key, these values change. Two companies merge, employees get new numbers. So now I have to change the employee number, not only in the employee table, but every foreign key table that links back to employee, I gotta update that too. So I've learned my own experience, my opinion is just go surrogate all the way, just slap 
an arbitrary value onto every table. <clears throat> and typically those are either a sequence number, one, two, three, four, or a UUID, which is a, uh, well, I'll let you look that up in Wikipedia if you don't know UUID. I do recommend looking it up. Uh, Postgres, every database supports a sequence number and will manage the generating of the numbers. Some, like Postgres, will uh, support UUID as a data type. So let's, if we're talking about relationships, there are different kinds related to the zero, one, many idea. When it's a one to one, um, here's an example where we have employees and we have badges. And as I said before, it all depends on your business context. So if the purpose of this database is to track only the current badge, we're, we're forgetting about all the badges they lost and we had to remake. If that's the purpose here, we have no history, then we have a one-to-one -one relationship because every badge has to belong to a person, uh, employee, and every employee has to have a badge. This is an example of a one-to-one. -one. Yeah? Why would you even do that? Why wouldn't you just have it in one table? Yes, why would you not combine those together? You can have those together. That is one option, is to take those fields, the badge printed date, badge number, and the photo, you could put those onto the employee table. And this is perfectly valid if we have that business rule that we, all, we don't care about the old ones. Now, in the real world, if I was building the system, I would break this out because I know they're going to want to track badge history. It's first time somebody loses a badge, it's like, well, how come we aren't tracking that? So sometimes you, know, you either confirm from your business people or you follow your instincts that this, uh, the, the rule I said about we're not tracking history, well, we probably would be tracking history. So it all depends on the context. So this does not work if you're going to track the history. But if people are really clear, I mean, I literally make uh, people sign a document about the business rules that says we are not tracking history here. So when they, you know, a year and a half later want to know why we don't have history on the badges, it's because they said they didn't want it. So how do you choose in the um, one to one? Well, if it's not because you're suspicious as I am about them changing the rules, then it's usually practical ones. A reason to have separate um, would be, for one thing, there's, there's uh, practicality security issues. So it might be that you don't want people changing the badge stuff. That is like for special certain users or a certain app. So it might be practical to have two tables and then in like Postgres, for example, you can have security on the table and constrain who has access to that table. For example, you could say people have access to read the data but not to change the data. Only the security officer should be changing the data. So um, that would be one practical reason to separate them out is for security. But otherwise, um, generally they should be together. Uh, functionally, I mean, with regards to normalization, they're both valid whether they were separate or together. Um, then we have the one-to-many relationships. So this is an example of invoices for a customer. So uh, each customer is going to hopefully buy more than one, one time from us. Every time they buy, they get an invoice. But every invoice, we don't bill with different people. We only bill one customer at a time for every single invoice. So this is an example where every invoice has one but the customer has many. Now, they could also have zero, right? When we have a new customer that we're talking to, a say, a, uh, what do they call it, sales prospect, then we put in a customer record for that, that customer, but we don't have any invoices yet. That's a case of zero. So this relationship is telling us that we tolerate that. And the one says that, yes, they can have a single invoice. We allow that. And we allow them to have multiple invoices. And that works so well, let's do it again with the line items on an invoice. Line items, this is a common thing too, where you see, if you're looking at documents, you see an invoice, you might think it's one thing if you're you know, new to this. But when you actually look in detail, you start to realize, well, the invoice is really about the date it was created, the date it's due, and paying the whole thing. The actual line items, they have their own fields, and they represent their own entity. So their entity is the product, the quantity, the price, and the extended cost. 
extended meaning, if you taught, multiply the quantity times the price, what are we charging them? So this is another example of one to many. Every invoice can have no line items if that's your business rule. So I've worked on apps where that was not allowed. You don't create an invoice without at least one or more line items. So again, this is, this is really critical uh, to the database, but also to your app. Um, but in this case, what this drawing says is we do allow the beginning of an invoice and um, with no line items or one or more than one. And if you're using that parent-child metaphor, you've got parent, child, grandchild. Not everybody uses that, but I do, and some people do. And it depends on the context. It's an easier way to say when you're talking about the relationships, when you're discussing it with another uh, developer. If you look at this version, notice there's a little white space on the invoice. All the line items have extended cost, right? So they buy uh, you know, three apples and four oranges and two bananas. So we have three different extended costs. Well, at some point, we want them to pay one grand total for the invoice. You might instinctively, especially if you're looking at a document, you see total at the bottom of invoice, you might think, hey, I'm going to put a total on my invoice. Relationally, that's wrong because you now have data that also exists in the other table. You've now duplicated your data. If, you've, if computers were theoretically infinitely fast, you would never need to do this because every time you pull up an invoice, you would find all the line items, grab the extended costs, and add them up, and then report that total. So relationally, this is wrong. But uh, well, the reason it's wrong is because the major goal of the relational database is, is to avoid redundant data. So a lot of the rules for normalizing, it all comes down to redundancy. You shouldn't have multiple copies of your data floating around. And the reason is, for one thing, practically, they just get out of whack. It's so easy to have a hole in the logic of your programming where you forget to update this total in certain conditions. I even had a problem once where uh, there was an app I was working on where it turned out the enter key was not triggering the code on the OK button. So if they click the OK button, the code ran, and if they hit the Enter key, the data was saved, but we didn't run the code to do that kind of updating work. So that's what I mean by it's, it's easy to have this get out of whack, where the total is not actually uh, the true number. So there are times when you violate the rules. We call that denormalizing. And usually it's going to be performance related. As I said, if computers were infinitely fast, you just grab the line items, retotal them, Computers are not infinitely fast. We do have limits to them. So there are practical reasons why you would have a total field on your invoice, but you need to consciously make the decision to denormalize and only do it as a last resort. It's like you never, ever do that. In fact, I would always talk to somebody else before doing this to think it through, to make sure there isn't some other solution. Denormalizing, you will pay a price. As I said, at the very least, you're going to have to write app code that does this extended cost gets the total. Or you can write server-side code in your database, something like Postgres. But you're going to have to take extra steps to make sure that those stay synced up. <clears throat> then uh, let's switch to a third type of relationship, which is many-to-many. -many. So we talked about one-to-one -one and one-to-many, but now many-to-many. -many. The classic example of this is books. When you have a book, you can have one author or more than multiple authors. You can have co-authors on a book. And of course, each author typically writes more than one book in their, in their career. So an author can have more than one book and vice versa. So now we have many in each direction. That is a problem. Relational databases do not support many to many. So let's talk about the line before we solve this problem. So the zero, in this case, what this shows is that we can have a book, and over on that end, we've got a zero, so that means we can have a book with no authors at all. That would mean that we're planning this book, but we haven't recruited an author for it. And vice versa, an author can have zero books in this business particular example. 
that would mean that we are recruiting an author, but we're only talking about books. We haven't really decided on what they're going to write yet. So that's the zero on each side. Or we can now assign an author. This book is going to have one author assigned to this book, and vice versa. <clears throat> so how do we solve the problem that you can't represent this directly in a, in a relational database? The answer is a third table. So anytime you have a many-to-many -many and you're really clear that those two entities are clean, you've really figured them out, but yet you know that there's many of each of these can relate to many of those, and each of those can relate to many of these, then you automatically, without thinking about it, you add another table. <coughs> um, and that table automatically gets two columns. It's going to have the ID from the book and the ID from the author. Those two will always be here. Some databases actually let you combine fields as a, a primary key on that table. And this is a really good example where you don't need this P key field. You, in Postgres at least, Postgres database, you can actually say, I want this field plus that field together to be my primary key. Um, again, in my, my experience, I just put a primary key, arbitrary, sorry, get one on everything. Um, but relationally, we don't, relationally, this is actually, actually relationally, this is incorrect. We really should be using these two if our database technically supports the combination. Then naming these, just as an aside, I have found that usually people are uncomfortable creating this third table, and often the reason is because the name is difficult to figure out. And in the business world, I think that's because this is often just, uh, this is often relationships between, these are like physical real entities. Like we, we've got, you know, author you can grab, book you can hold in your hand, but then the relationship between the two, there's nothing uh, uh, tangible about that. So I think that's typically, I don't know, kind of met almost metaphysical error, but in my experience, that's the case. These are usually going to be a relationship. In this case, we have a word for it, which is authorship. Often there's no one good word, so you have things like this assigned to that is going to be the name of the table. <clears throat> now, you only need these two fields. Because this actually now lets us, uh, every time that we assign a book to an author, what we do is we pick the author in the app, uh, we create the book, we pick the author, so now we've got a primary key for the book, and we know which author primary key. So then we insert into this table, and we add the two values here together. And you're done. It's like now we can do a query, a join query, across these tables, and we can get a list of books and authors together. Yeah. So what, what's that table called that when you create? Does, does it have a specific? Oh, some people call it bridge table, bridging. I see different names. There's no official name. No but usually it's, uh, um, I like the word bridging. Sure. It's yeah, one, it's one of the more common ones. Bridging. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's no good word for that. I wish there was. Not even a word for what's hard to name. <clears throat> so let's, oh. I'm going to show you an example of joining to get example data, but I wanted to point out there's an issue here of royalties. Sometimes you have other fields. You have to have at least the two foreign key for each table. This is a foreign key because here it's foreign, pulling down the ID of the book and pulling down the ID of the author. Sometimes you have additional fields. So this royalty is a really good example of that. Which, where else would you put royalty? If you put royalty on the author, you're saying, well, every book this author writes, she's always going to get whatever, 5%, 15%, whatever it is. Um, and that would have to apply to everything that she ever writes. So that doesn't feel right, does it? Yeah. And you, you don't want to put it on the book because authors often contribute in different quantities. So one might get a much bigger royalty than the other. Well, that right, tells you right there. It's per book and per author, so therefore the royalty should be on the authorship. So if we have co-authors, Susan and John, that means that Susan's getting 15%, John's getting 5%. So there'd be two rows in this table. And here's that example um, where, looking at this example, where we've done a join. So this column is coming from the book table. 
those two columns are coming from the uh, person, the author table. And royalty is coming from that middle table. Now what I've left off here are the primary keys and foreign keys. And in apps, you're almost always going to have the primary key values and the, the uh, foreign key values. But you're going to hide them. You're going to suppress the display from the user. So almost always when you see a table like this, there's actually more columns. And almost every kind of grid tool in any environment, they have a feature to suppress some of those columns. And the reason why you want those columns there, because if you do things like let the user select this row and then hit a button to open up detail, you need to know which book and which author you were talking about. So you would keep the, uh, the two foreign key columns on this table so that the app code knows about it, but the user's not bothered by it. And let's talk about, um, Earlier, we had, a, we had an example of cramming employee numbers together into a single field. And I said that was the wrong way to do it. So let's talk about the right way to do it, which is, um, again, a third table. So what we were saying is that that project can have uh, multiple employees, and each employee can be assigned to multiple projects. So we need to create an assignment. You could call this assignment or project assignment. Like I said, the name can be tricky to figure out. Um, but we know we're going to have the two fields, foreign key from uh, linking back to the employee, back to the project. And in this case, we might have a field like start date. Start date represents when does this person start that project? When does their uh, duties begin? So that's another example of having fields on this middle table, the bridge table. And that actually covers my material. Usually my talks run over time. Let's see, what are we, uh, what are we half hours? So we've got 15, which is good because I, um, well, I'll talk about how you can learn more. But uh, it might be fun to, to, to take on um, uh, examples, projects that you have, and we can try to figure out how to normalize the database tables. Because doing it, that's the best way to learn, is like see examples. Which, by the way, I should put it on here to learn more. Have you heard of Stack Exchange? Or excuse me, Stack Overflow is a huge website for question and answers by programmers. Well, the company that did that started doing other versions. There's one set up just for database. It's called dba.stackexchange. Um, they have some for pets and they have some for home repair. But now, besides Stack Overflow, they have dba.stackexchange. Both Stack Overflow, I would recommend you look at Stack Overflow and DBA Stack Exchange because uh, looking for examples. It's great where people have, you know, here's my little business problem, and then you'll see multiple people's answers, their take on how to, you know, if I've got customers and invoices, how do I make my tables right? Usually the catch is in the question, they don't explain all the business rules, so that's the limitation. Also, look at Wikipedia page. There is a Wikipedia page on database normalization. I it's it gonna look good. really, what's that? I thought it was very good. Oh yeah, I, I think it's, it's gotten, it's improved a lot. But I do wanna warn you, don't get hung up on, they're gonna talk about normal forms, that's all the math theory that I was talking about. When you read these normal forms and you're just seeing these generic descriptions, it's like, it's hard to make any sense out of it. Um, so that's why I was saying, when you look at real examples and real solutions, you will see how the rules and the normal forms got applied. And so I would recommend reading this and rereading it and, and don't, don't think you're like too dumb to do this or something. Looking at those normal forms, it is hard to understand because it's completely abstract when they're just described. But basically, <clears throat> as I said earlier, underneath all of them, it's got to do with redundant data. It's like we don't want to have, we want to have the least amount of data in the database possible is the goal. Um, I think. Yeah, so if you want to leave, you can leave, but otherwise, uh, I'd be glad to, to take as a challenge, throw out a problem that you're working on, you. a business situation, and uh, we can try to normalize them on the fly. Yeah? I actually have a suggestion. When you're naming intermediary tables, I actually use the name of the two tables with an underscore, 
So like authors underscore books? Yeah, that's one common approach. Yeah, I try to look for a word. Like to me, authorship is very descriptive, but when you don't have one, then yes, you can use the two tables. Um, sometimes I try to put like a verb in there. Um, you know, it's like, um, you know, team assignment or something like that. Or X, X, X verb relates to whatever. But yeah, whatever makes sense to you. But yeah, the two tables is, the two table names combined with an underscore. Because um, by the way, in SQL, just generally it's best to never have, um, always use lowercase in your names and underscore between your words uh, if you want a maximum portability between different databases. Um, yeah? Uh, scenario, I guess. Uh huh. Uh, so I have an app where you, I work on an app where you uh, say, like, this thing happened when and latitude, longitude. Okay. And what the thing was. Okay. And latitude, longitude is, like, pretty accurate. It's down to, like, six or seven uh, decimal places. So what I'm currently doing is storing. So are you saying something happened at that location? That's yeah. What tracking? And it's like, you know, it's a, I have a table for things that happened. And so it's like an ID, the ID of the thing that happened, the accurate latitude and longitude. Okay. Uh, and then like the, the date and time. And so what I'm doing currently is storing the latitude and longitude, the accurate one with that kind of like information about the thing that happened. And then I have like a geocoded latitude longitude table that's like fuzzy. You know, uh, it's like tr it's really bad. I'm not using like I'm using MySQL, so I'm just like truncating and saying like if the latitude and longitude both match, truncated at like you know three uh, decimal places. So I'm storing uh -huh. the date that that was created, the geocoded address. I'm storing the very accurate geocoded address that was used for that geocoded. And then yeah, I get the yeah. address information. Are you you're trying to wrap these things that happened into a more general a grouping by the yeah, like location? Within, yeah, within like you know a thousand feet or you're something. You're saying within that yeah, we like have more particular area areas matches. within the, this particular fuzzy area. And the whole the whole point is to like be accurate enough. It doesn't need to be like scary accurate with the geocode. Okay, the address so and to reduce calls out to an external service to geocode by fuzzy matching. And I'm wondering if that strategy that I've currently got employed because I don't really know databases is like Boy, that, not bad. Uh, you had to give me a hard one. That is hard to figure out. Um, first, let me say you should be using Postgres, not MySQL. I, well, PostGIS yeah, seems to be <laughs> but like, I don't No, I don't mean in general. Postgres I mean specifically for geographical stuff. Because they have PostGIS. PostGIS is an so add-on cool. to Postgres. It's super. It's, it, it actually the, leads the industry. Yeah, because I was yeah. using MySQL to like run some kind of weird math that I found yeah. on Stack Overflow to get the cumulative distance between a set of points in order. And that took so long. Yeah, you would not believe how powerful PostGIS is. Yeah. I don't even know about geolocation stuff, but I've seen some examples and demos. And you're really lucky because in our booth, the guy Lloyd over there today, he uh, he knows a lot about, he, he has actually done geolocation the hard way all on his own, doing math. He did airports and ranges of fuel. He did all the math because it's not Flat. It's a sphere. So he did all the spherical math stuff. He actually gave a nice talk on showing the hard way. Then he showed it with, with PostGIS. So you should definitely look at that because that probably will solve this problem. There's probably ways to generalize the area. So that would probably solve your whole problem. But back to the relational aspect of you're trying to, these things that happen that have a very specific point and you want to group them by a larger point. Yeah, yeah that tells me that you need a parent table and a child table. Um, if you know, uh, especially if you know this, like like you like campus, right? You're trying to track all. You know the campus of this college, and you know the campus of another college. So you would have a parent table that would have camp be called campus, and it would have the coordinates for the whole general area, and then you would have things that relate to that. The things that happen have the much finer points, but they would belong to one of those campuses. Does that make sense? That would logically, yeah, that, uh, the only, the, the tricky part was if you're kind of like trying to create the fuzzy areas, 
you don't predetermine, you don't know those ahead of time, you're sort of trying to pre-figure those out. Yeah, basically what I was doing was just saying like, okay, I didn't find a match to four decimal places for both latitude and Yeah, no, that's what post-GIS is for. Yeah, yeah post-GIS you, you seems need to, to make it really easy to draw a circle. Yeah. Because with truncating, I'm drawing a square. Uh, which is oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, not circles. You can do crazy shaped areas. Oh yeah, because yes. you can like you have can a, do anything you want. Yeah, you have a table of just yeah. shapes, and then you can check is this in a shape or how much yeah. of these shapes overlap. And that's where it got like way above. And yeah, yeah. Of that so relationally, yeah. If you've got points in a general area, I would define the parent table as the general area with the fuzzy numbers, the, the less accurate numbers, and then the much accurate on each would be the children records. So it'd be one to many relationship. Any others? Thing you're working on? Yeah. Or so any other questions? Talking about uh, multiple tables versus one larger table. Um, is there any rules of thumb there that sort of use uh, breaking things down? Like take, say, for example, a membership database. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, you've got regular things like name, address, phone number, things like that. And then you've got like PayPal information over multiple years. Okay. Okay. So I'm just thinking. Should you put the current uh, PayPal information in, on the same record? So you're saying each member has paid and they've had different PayPal accounts or different, different payment PayPal, methods different over time? Payments, different payments. <coughs> right. That would be like the address where you would have a member table yeah. and then you would have a child table for their particular payment method if you're keeping the history of different or you're allowing them to have multiple methods currently. Yeah. So if you want the history or multiple current in either case, you need to have a child table. So you would have a parent table of member and a child table of payment method. So it would have a foreign key of the ID of the member to which this payment method. Yeah. Payment method table would have the, you know, is it, is it MasterCard, Visa, PayPal, whatever. And then would you have a grandchild method for actual payment, a table for actual payments? For actual payments, yeah, you want that to would be, um, Uh, <laughs> you, you gotta, that's actually a tricky one now um, because the payment involves the payment method. Well, no, in theory, you would have the, the grandparent customer, then child to, the grandparent, then the, the child to it is a payment method, and the child to it would be each payment. So if there's a MasterCard for Susan, so she used her MasterCard three times. There would be three payment records that each belong to the one single MasterCard <laughs> record for her. And then it would have a link to the one Susan record up at the top. And then you'd have another payment method record for the time when she sent a check. Exactly. Right. If she used checks, then we would have, uh, well, a check. If we're tracking the check for the bank account, the routing number, so we'd have Susan. We'd have the payment method, would have two rows in it for her, one for check, one for MasterCard. And then yes, check might have one row, one payment, and the MasterCard one would have three. Yeah. So now we have four records down at the bottom, but we, by joining, we can, just as we did earlier with the books, we can join and say, oh, here's Susan, and uh, we can have Susan and the method, Susan MasterCard X, Susan MasterCard Y, Susan MasterCard Z, Susan check A. And that would show up as one, one report table. That's a good example of parent, child, grandchild. Yeah. I think this is kind of. I, wait, let me say, yeah. I kind of laughed at first because in real payments, it gets more complicated than all this. <laughs> but given what we just said, that's all true. It's just in real life, it's a little hairier in real business. Yeah. Uh, in the same example, I think this is kind of an invoice total again. But would you ever keep the grandparent ID and the grandchild? Okay, so he's asking about denormalizing by putting the keys of other records and other, like across these tables. Um, uh, well, relationally, no, that's wrong. It's like, no, you would not have the customer ID. What we were just talking about with customer payment method and payments, the payment method would not know about Susan's ID. And it doesn't need to because the database knows how to traverse these tables. Because we define the relationship, uh, oh, and what's cool, a sophisticated database like Postgres is actually smart at looking at the relationships. When you define a foreign key between customer, uh, yeah, customer and payment method, um, Postgres is aware of that. There's a whole query planner. When you say select 
blah, where blah equals whatever, there's a whole engine inside Postgres that, called the Query Planner, and it figures out what's the smart way to do it. Uh, because there are ways to hack, depending on the indexes that you've defined, it can, often there's multiple ways to skin that cat. So it'll look at the relationships and figure out, well, you know, if we find, if we're looking only for MasterCard payments, it makes more sense to start with MasterCard and then project into the payments than it is to get all the payments and then go find which main method they belong to. That's what's cool about an uh, engine like Postgres. It does all that work for you. You never have to think about it. So because of that, you don't need to get cute with trying to outsmart the database engine and put Susan's ID down on payments. Usually that is a, somebody, it's usually an app developer who thinks they're really clever, may be really clever, but they don't realize that that's the job of the database. Don't, don't try to outdo the database. I guarantee you, like I said, the decades of work that have been put in on Postgres are far better than any one developer. Yeah? Um, so what about like a historical problem with like that customer invoice scenario where the customer is a business that gets bought out, changes their name and their address, but they're still going to order stuff from you. So you want your historical invoices to still say the correct information. Oh Lord, this, that has bit me once on a database I did with employees and they started um, recycling employee records. <laughs> so when somebody would quit, they would just like put the na first and their last name to like, you know, quit. And then when they hired somebody, this, the secretary was putting in the new person's name. Well, what that did is, okay, so Susan quit, now we have John in there. Well, now you bring up John, who just got hired today, and he's got Susan's four years history of history of work, right? Mm -hmm. Of all the stuff he's worked on, you know, is like there. Well, that was Susan's work. So that's what I think you're asking is, um, um, so, um, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> it's like, so you, you probably want to just build some controls around updating those fields and maybe instead and you know, there's no, creating a new record? There is no easy answer to that. See, that, that example of what I just said, there's nothing to stop that clerk from going in and changing um, Susan Johnson to, to John Smith. Um, so that is, there are limits to what we can do as DBAs and as developers. Um, in that case, I had to educate the people involved. And then what I did is to, um, I mean, in the app, I did some controls. So when they do, you know, person quit, you know, separated, there's a separation button, you know, to, to separate an employee. And then what I do is, um, um, it's a field on the table. So there's your answer. There's a field on the table called separated or quit, you know, gone. So when that is true, then the record is always read only. But I had to do that in the app. The database doesn't support that, uh, unless you maybe wrote some. Well, you could, yeah, you could write server-side code in Postgres. You could write triggers that would look and say, you know, um, maybe a check constraint would do this, where you'd say, you know what, if separated is true, and I see that the before and after of the first name field is changed, don't. This is an error, and the database can throw the error. You could write that in your check constraint or your trigger and say, if separated is true and the, the name has changed, throw an error back to the app and do not accept this record. That's your solution. Thank you. Yeah. So I was wrong. There is a way to solve that in the database, which is pretty cool. Um, I kind of have feet in both worlds of app development and database work. Um, but basically, I'm always trying to learn. There's like, especially Postgres is so incredibly powerful. But I'm always learning there's so much more I can push into the database instead of uh, take it out of my app, put it in the database side. And that's a good example where I used to would have done that in the app, but really that does belong in the database side. Or both, then they're a double check on each other. That was a good question, like the others. Any other questions or challenges? Yeah. I need a question. Um, when you talk about the denormalization just before, uh, was it because the, 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 the last database with all the lines inside can be uh, very, very large? And to get better performance, like instead of reading in all this database, you, you put back the, the, the total of the, 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 the invoice in, oh, the, the, it, okay. in, the, uh, in the table. In the We're talking about performance when you have yeah. uh, putting the total on the invoice, adding yes. up the related children records yes. in the invoice is, item. Is that because the engine has to go through the 
all the lines there to, to Yes, yes. If you had gazillions of invoices with, with even more bazillions of line items and you're trying to do grand totals on those, it could be a significant performance hit. Now, for small, regular, this is like, um, uh, I mean, generally with today's hardware and the power of Postgres is not something to generally worry about. You'd have to, until you're getting millions or tens of millions of records, you really don't need to be worrying about performance in Postgres. Uh, especially if you do a little bit of tuning in terms of giving it more memory. Because um, Postgres is rather conservative on what it demands by default, so you can, there's, there are little settings you can change. So, um, yeah, but if, it, like I said, looking up those children records and totaling them up, that is work. So yeah, for a thousand invoices, ten thousand invoices, it's going to be instantaneous. When you get millions and millions, maybe not. Um, so that's why you might denormalize and choose to have the total field. Now there are other reasons to have the total. Well, no, that's basically it. It's like you're re writing reports and you just want to grab the total, um, and you don't want to have to do all that other joining down into that other table and, and summing it up. But like I said, do not. You really, if you're learning this stuff, you should really not denormalize. You should push yourself to do it right and um, write the join codes. And you will really, you'll, when you see the elegance of it, it's like light bulb clicks in your head and you see how clean this is. Clean, what I mean is you can make changes in your apps without breaking the database. You don't have to change the database when you change the way you're doing some coding and stuff in your app. Uh, that's what I mean by clean. And you'll find when you write the queries, if it's getting really gnarly and complicated, it's probably because you have a wrong, you denormalized and didn't know it. You don't have a normalized database structure. Um, yeah. So for example, the, oh, the other reason is um, you can't do what's called ad hoc queries. So that total assumed that you wanted all the, all the line items. Okay, I, I worked for an ad agency once that was, well, Seattle, you've probably heard of the Frango candies, the little chocolates, yes. Well, that was an old uh, competitor, Frederick and Nelson. And when they went under, Bon Marche, I worked for Bon Marche, and they bought the rights to the Franco candy. Well, they thought they did. When the company, when Frederick and Nelson's collapsed, there was a whole tussle. Somebody else thought they bought the rights to the candy. So we had, you know, the Bon Marche was in a court case and had to produce uh, for the court evidence of having done Frangos. So here I was writing queries in the database to look for every ad where one of the products on the ad was a Frango candy. Oh, no. So now I don't want the total on the ad. I don't want the total of the value of all the products being, um, that's equivalent to line items. I don't want all the line items. I only want the line items that said Frango on them. So now my totals have nothing to do with the whole invoice. So that's an example where you've locked yourself in when you have that total on there. Maybe you want a total of taxable items versus non-taxable items. Maybe you want items that have hazmat stuff on them, you know, haz hazardous material related, because you're doing a safety report. So that's where you're gonna write your own total. The aggregate, I think I mentioned this talk or the one before, mentioned about aggregate totals. That's why you want the, to dynamically calculate your aggregates, because maybe I only want the, the hazmat related uh, children items, not all of them. That's Static against dynamic. Uh, yeah, static versus dynamic. So yeah, when you denormalize and have that total number, because it's kind of like, like I said, the whole problem is it's redundant. You just froze for that moment in time what that total is. And the related items, well, for one thing, we have concurrency issues. Those related items could be being changed. Another user in the app or another app could be changing the line items. And now your total may not actually reflect their value. Now, Postgres will, has um, what's called version control. MVCC is an acronym for taking snapshots. So it will help prevent that inconsistency. But you can avoid the whole problem by not having the total at all. So yes, if I were designing that as, as a student learning this, I would write the invoice with line items to not have a total on the invoice. Yeah? You might want the total because you might want to say, like, all the invoices from one customer. You might want to sort those by the total, like have the most. In theory, you can do that all dynamically in your SQL. So did you hear him? He was saying, well, what if you had multiple invoices for a customer and I wanted the big invoices, the, the highest totals on top? So I want to sort by that total column. Technically, 
with the power of SQL, you can generate the total value as a virtual column at the point of the query and do an order by sort on that generated column. That is completely doable in SQL. Would that be really, I mean, would that be really performance bad? That's what we've been talking about, right? Is yes, it's gonna it's more work for the computer in Postgres to do that than if you had the total already pre-calculated. And as I said, there's trade-offs there. Um, denormalizing, you're always gonna pay a price. Like I said, every time you, I don't know if I mentioned it, if you make denormalize and choose to have that total field, document it really thoroughly as what your logic was and, and justify it. Like imagine you're going to court and had to defend that choice. Um, because you're gonna confuse other programmers. I mean, an invoice total is kind of obvious, but Anybody else looking at the, your code, they're going to be like, wait a minute, isn't total related to those? And why is it here? That's not, that's denormalizing. So a great feature in Postgres is you can attach notes to a column definition. So besides having a name on a column and a data type on a column, you can have notes. So in the notes is where I would say, okay, Chris on this date decided we should denormalize because of these performance reasons we were seeing when dealing with more than 10 million, you know, generating these reports that we do every day. You know that kind of stuff. There's alternatives to um, there's alternatives to denormalizing when you're trying to solve performance problems. One of them is run your report in the middle of the night instead of the middle of the day. If that's that's an easy no-brainer. Another one is indexing. It may be that for that particular report, when you're doing this kind of queries, there's certain indexes you might want to add. Well, Postgres is very good now about um, dynamically adding indexes and then dropping them. So in the middle of the night, when you're running the report, add the indexes. And then, see, indexes have a downside that every time you're adding or manipulating, changing that value in the rows, the index has to be updated. So indexes are help be fast, they help you be faster doing a query, but they slow you down when you're doing data entry or data modification. So sometimes if you're just doing your reports in the middle of the night, you might turn on indexes, run all your reports, and when they're done, delete the indexes. That's another option around index performance. On a virtual field. Yes, you can actually do that. You can actually have an index in Postgres on a calculated value. That would be an excellent uh, example of that, yeah. You can actually build an index on the calculated value, yeah. Yeah, I said Postgres is amazing. The more I learn, the more amazed I am. Any other, what's our time? Oh, that is our time, I guess, yes. Thanks. <laughs>